The reading today is from Luke chapter 10, 25 through 37. This is a familiar reading, so try to listen with new ears. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. <clears throat> and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise.
Let us pray. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad V'hat Eth Adonai Eloheiko Viku Levavka Uvko Meodeka V'hat Lorecha Chamoka Amen. It's one of the most famous Jewish prayers there is. Hear, O Israel, which could be translated, Wake us up. We are God wrestlers. Wake us up. Yahweh, you are our God. You are one. Help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, wake us up is our prayer this morning. Amen. So as Sandy warned you as she began to read this very familiar text for many of us that grew up in church, the story of the Good Samaritan, yes, it is. We, in a sense, we've been inoculated to this story. We've been immunized. We've heard it so much that it doesn't have its full potency on us because the purpose of this story is to kill us. And we've heard it so much, it just makes us sick. Uh, we know what we're supposed to do and we're not doing it. But it really hasn't had that full throttle uh, destruction of our selfish, egoic nature that it was intended, I believe, as Jesus first crafted and told this story. So I'll try and t take the immunization off and, and give us the full dose this morning. As Dr. Luke, who recorded this for us, would prescribe. So uh, the story goes, so the teacher of the law comes and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And as I've shared previously in this series of uh, the parables, that eternal life isn't just life everlasting. That's a different, eternal life is a rich, vibrant, full life in the here and now. It's not in the, the sweet by and by, it's in the right here, right now, a quality of living that is robust. That's eternal life. And the teacher comes and says, what must I do? And he's probably uh, taken Jesus 101 because he knows what Jesus' answer would be from other portions in the Bible. And he says, well, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors, yourself. Right. And so, but he wants to qualify this to make it manageable. Who's my neighbor? What are the limits of what I have to do? And so then Jesus tells this very, very famous story. And as the story goes, a traveler was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now I've been there, been on this road, and it is a steep descent. Jerusalem sits up high. That's why it was sort of a fortress city because it was very elevated. And Jericho is down by the Dead Sea. So it's at a very low sea level. And so the road to go down was very steep and there were bandits that would often be on the sides of the road looking for uh, people to rob. And so that was a common, it was the bad part of town going on this road. So as it goes, uh, it's it, uh, considered a, a Jewish man, an Israelite, is the one going down. And he gets waylaid by ne'er-do-wells. And he is left half dead or left for dead. He's been robbed and laying there in a ditch. And as Jesus tells the story, first a priest and then a Levite come by. And they do not stop to help one of their own kins people, one of their own kinsmen. And for centuries, you know, preachers like me have used this to mock religious people. Well, see, that's what the religious people do. They talk a good game, but they won't stop and help anybody. And so uh, the priest and the Levite have been the butt of many jokes, uh, according to this parable. But there could be quite honestly, very good reasons why the priest and the Levite did not stop to help this man. Very logically good reasons. Uh, first of all, if the man really is dead, they would be unclean. They would become unclean in helping 
this man. They would be ritually unclean. Now that may not seem like a big deal to you, but for them that meant loss of work. Because for them to do their jobs at the temple in Jerusalem, they had to be ritually clean. So imagine catching COVID. If I stop and help this guy, I could get COVID and I'm going to miss a couple of weeks or a month's worth of work. And my family just can't afford that. I can't take a month. You know, there was no sick days in the Bible times. And so if I'm not at work, there's no money for my family, no food for my family. I can't afford to risk time off. Or uh, another thought could be, what if the people that waylay this guy are still here, and if I stop and help, they're going to waylay me. And then there's two of us laying in a ditch, and that's not going to help anybody. Or what if they think, well, what if I stop and help this guy, and the cops show up, and they think I did it, and then I get arrested. And then wh what's going to happen you know, so th th there could be many good, or, you know, there's no good cell coverage in this part of town. And if I stop, I'm going to be hours late for dinner. My wife's going to be upset because she knows I'm traveling through a bar bad part of town and I don't want to stress everybody. So there could be many good reasons why the priest and the Levite do not stop to help the man in the ditch. It's not just because they were selfish. I mean, look, we've all been there. You see somebody hitchhiking on the road that looks a little, I don't know that I want him in the car. You know, we've, we have all experienced this. And then Jesus says there was a Samaritan. And as Sandy warned us, this once again, we've heard this so many times. And we think of Samaritans, oh yeah, yeah, we understand. Now back in the days... When I was a Pentecostal preacher, and I would speak in evangelical churches, to just give the crowd a taste of what Jesus' original hearers would have heard when he said the word Samaritan, I intentionally, when I would read this passage, changed the word from Samaritan to homosexual. I would say, then there was a homosexual that saw the man and stopped, to give them the sense of what the original hearers would have. But for you, that wouldn't do much. And so I would, for this crowd, I would say, imagine instead of a Samaritan, if there was a, uh, a, a man with a red MAGA hat and on his car it said, Rush is right. And he stopped to help the man in the ditch. That's the, the feeling that engenders that this is one that stops. And, and so the question is, is the why, which I, I, I think is important. Because for centuries, again, as this story has been told and retold, we've all been encouraged to do good things for those in need, to help the less fortunate. For crying out loud, we have a good Samaritan fund in this church to help our neighbors in need when they run low on money. We go back to this story and say, well, we've got a good Samaritan fund just for you. But as I wrestle with this parable of Jesus, the, the why is what's really, really important. Not the what, what we do. Doing good for others, that, that's a good thing. But the why we do it is really, really important. And, and I think the why in this story is the Samaritan helped a man that was different from him, that was other, that was not the same as him. But the Samaritan knew what it felt to be an outcast all of his life. He knew what it was to be avoided. He knew what it was to be marginalized. And so when he sees another person who is marginalized, he responds out of identification. It's not just, see, see, sometimes people can do good things for others simply out of pity. Well, what a shame, you don't have enough money. Well, here, let me see what I got. You know, and, and while I'm doing a good thing, a mitzvah, as our Jewish brethren would say, and it's always good to do a mitzvah, that's not the best motivation. 
to just have pity on somebody. Well, boy, you should have thought about it, but you should have traveled at a safer time or taken a different route. But anyway, uh, you didn't hear, let me help you out. That's pity. Compassion is feeling what you feel. It, it comes from, it, it's a compound word. Com is with in the Latin, and passio is to suffer, to suffer with, compassion. And so to identify, I understand, I know what it feels like to be an outcast. I know what it is to feel like nobody wants me, or people are afraid of me, or that I am marginalized and not worth being helped. I know what that feels like, so let me help you because I identify with that. I think that's what is at the heart of this story. And, and I want to share with you a personal story of where I had a Samaritan experience, unawares, unawares. It was quite a few years ago, like 1990, 91, somewhere in there. Uh, one of my dearest friends, one of my best friends, a man that was like a brother to me, was in the same evangelical charismatic church system that I was at the time. Although we lived in different cities, we had become very close, meeting often at conferences and church gatherings, and his family and my family became really, really close friends and would often visit together and vacation together. Well, as it went, my friend got sick and was in the hospital for a little bit uh, with pneumonia. And so after he got out of the hospital, we went down to visit them, my wife and I, uh, and he and his wife and three kids, and uh, just to celebrate that he was back home and doing better and, and all that. And so it was well, one evening, it was about dusk, and my wife and his wife and their three kids went off to the grocery store to get some groceries so we could do a a party sort of a thing and he and I were at his house and uh, he said I gotta I gotta tell you something I said what so we went into the kitchen and you know it's so crazy all that year you know almost what 40 years ago 30 years I don't know 90, 1990 yeah we're sitting in his kitchen it was like the dusk and I can remember it was orangey because the Sun was setting and we're sitting on bar stools in the kitchen and he looks at me and he says I got to tell you something. I said, what? He said, I've got AIDS. I said, what? He said, I've got AIDS. And it was like time froze. I could hear my heart beating. And I'm looking at him and he's looking at me. And, and I, I, I muttered out, how, how, how. And he said, all my life I've been a homosexual. And I'm married to my wife and have our kids. But on the weekends, I would often go off and, and meet guys. And I, I got AIDS. And he's staring at me. And I don't know what to do. I had not been to seminary. I didn't have any counseling class. I'm sitting there. And in all my life, I don't know that I have ever felt closer to Jesus than in that moment. And I don't know, but the Spirit of God came upon me. I got up off my stool. I walked over to him and kissed him on the cheek. And I said, you are my brother. And we will go through this together. And I don't know why. I, I identified with he was my brother. He was my friend. And so for the next three years, we traveled together as he died a absolutely horrible death. In the early 90s, I don't know if you can remember, AIDS was was terrifying. Uh, you, you were afraid if someone would spit on you, you would get it. Or, I mean, it was just, it was terrifying. I can, it was about a year later, my son was born. 
And, and for some reasons, my friend Petey, I call him Petey, it wasn't his name, but Petey came to live with Cindy and I for three or four days a week. He got a job where we lived to make some money and then he would go back home on the weekends. And so for a couple of years, he lived with us three or four days a week. And so during that time, my son was born. My son was a cesarean because he had his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. So they did the cesarean and at the hospital, they let me carry my son from the delivery room to the nursery in the hospital. And my friend Petey was there with me. And, and I can remember coming out of that delivery room and handing my son to Petey so he could hold him. And in that time, you know, people with AIDS were felt like you couldn't touch them. And that was so powerful. We just cried. And then I took my son to the nursery. And uh, there were so many events over that time. I remember near the end, about uh, a few months before he died, he had been traveling to another part of the state and we're, dr we're driving by our house and he thought he was dying. He was in horrific pain. And so he pulled off the highway and they came to our house and he's just screaming and writhing in, in agonizing pain. And after a, a little while, we realized he wasn't dying yet. He had kidney stones on top of everything else and it was just ugly. And so I didn't want his kids to have to see this. And so I told him, you go, it, get in your car, you drive home, I'll follow in my car, I'll bring Petey with me. So, and so we're in the car driving in the night towards his home, he's screaming in pain. And I just started, you know, why didn't you ever tell anybody? Why did, why, 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 why? And he looked at me and he said, because I was so afraid no one would want me that I would be rejected. And the insanity of, of the kind of Christianity I was trying lived out smacked me in the face. That someone that loved God as much as I do or did was terrified to be real for fear of rejection. And I could identify with that. And my friend died, and I did the funeral and stayed very close with his family. And I did all that. I'm sharing this story because I behaved as the Samaritan did, not trying to do something good. How I, I couldn't do anything other. He was my brother. He, he and so the doing of good things, as, as we work to make a sanctuary here where it's a safe place for everybody and we want to do good to each other, we're doing that not out of pity to help somebody out that's less fortunate than we are. We're doing that because we're this, we are sisters and brothers and siblings to each other. We identify with each other. We're all in this together. So it's not a, a lesser than, it's a together thing. That's why we say, we gather here for connection, not perfection. We're in this together, trying to follow Jesus on the way of radical love. When preparing the, for this parable and the, the sharing of this reflection, I, I've been reading N.T. Wright, who is a, uh, an Orthodox theologian. So, it's somewhat shocking that I would read an Orthodox theologian, but I am. And N.T. Wright taught at Oxford. He was a brilliant man. And he, here some observations he has about this parable that I think tie it up together for me. He says, the Jew in the ditch discovered that the Samaritan was his neighbor. He also discovered that the other two travelers on the road were not his neighbors. And at that time in Jesus' ministry, Outsiders were coming into the realm of God. And that is to say by implication that those that felt they were insiders, that they deserved it, that they were worthy of it, they would earned it either by birth or by their behavior, were being left out. And then N.T. Wright says this, and I love this. He says, 
the teacher of the law said, what must I do to inherit ha olam haba, eternal life? And the answer is to follow Jesus in finding a new and radicalized version of oh Torah God. observance, loving Israel's covenant God meant loving this God as creator of all and discovering as neighbors those who were beyond the borders of the chosen people. And so as we work to create a sanctuary here where people can experience eternal life, it is my encouragement that we do so in a way that encourages the love of Yahweh on all, even outside the borders of those who might be considered worthy folk. So the story of the Good Samaritan for me is a story of identification, which is exactly what Jesus has done with us. If you believe Jesus to be divine, if you believe him to be eternally begotten, the Holy One of God sent his Redeemer. He stood at the River Jordan and said, I'm with them. I need baptized. I too am with them. And so my, my friends, as we do the work we're trying to do here, let's do it in a way where we identify with everybody that comes through these doors and to give of our hearts in a way that is honoring and saying to them, we are with you. May it be so. Amen.